Good evening. Captain Retired Matt Edwards with the next installment of the Facebook Live Observation Post Weekly Report. Now, uh, I'm not going to do the usual uh, four to six items. I'm going to do a couple items because I'm going to talk about a couple of conversations I've had and how I've been triggered by some of the most recent discoveries that I've made. And basically everything is out there in plain sight, hidden in plain sight. But, again, I'll go through two items on my numbered list that I have put into my files by a part of my group. And then I'll talk about the nature of pensions and the things that I've discovered that have troubled me so much. Number 343 on the numbered list is program arrangement. Now, that's the program arrangement between the Department of National Defense and the Department of Veterans Affairs. Now, under the program arrangement, there are three signatories. And two of them are part of the National Defense. One is CISA Financial Services, one is the Canadian Forces, and the other one is Veterans Affairs. So there's three signatories, but none of them represent the Canadian Forces members. Section 3.2.1 cedes the right to service attribution in the case of medical release to the Department of National Defense by consent. Now, what I'm talking about is that sometimes there is a conflict between the Department of National Defense and the Department of Veterans Affairs about who decides when a person has been injured in military service. Now, the Canadian Forces Ombudsman put out a report, I think it was in 2016, and they suggested that it should be the Department of National Defense slash the Canadian Forces that does this determination, and you know, it makes sense in many ways. In fact, they already do it. They do it in the case of the Service Income Support Insurance Plan for Reservists under Section 41A3 of the policy. In order to get approved for CISIP long-term disability, you have to be determined to have been injured on duty. Now, another one is for, again, Reservists, and it's for uh, Compensation. Uh, I forget the name of it now. Reserve Force Compensation, RFC under Compensation and Benefit Instruction 210.73. I got a thing for numbers. So, and the third one is for the return of contributions, again, for the Service Income Support Insurance Plan. Back in 2009 or 2011, former Minister of National Defense, Peter McKay, they said that they were going to return the contributions that the person made during their career to the Canadian Forces member when they had been injured on duty. Which is total bullshit. I don't think anybody ever got a refund. But they said they do. Now, what I'm saying is, is that Veterans Affairs might say that they have the sole right to do it. But that's bullshit because the Canadian Forces already does it. Plus, there's no difference between the departments because they are what you call emanations of the Crown. So, Veterans Affairs doesn't have any more right to do it than National Defense. And National Defense don't have any more right to do it than Veterans Affairs Canada. Both should have the right to make the determination. And if one does it, basically, it's been done. And don't waste taxpayers' money and our time doing it again. Now, i got to be honest, when I was looking at the next point, i got to try to refresh my memory what I was thinking of. Basically, is what I was talking about, the Reserve Force Compensation. I said, review workers' compensation for Reserve Force history. Now, I put in brackets, done already with a question mark, because I'm not sure. Now, see, what it is is that <clears throat> back when McKay was diddling around with these things, around 2009 or 2011, they said that, Reservists could get workers' compensation. Now, that's because an injured reservist, they don't look as, a, as, as an injured soldier. So, under the federal law, the Government Employee Compensation Act is the federal workers' compensation. And what it does is that it says that if you are a federal worker, like I used to work for CRA, 
Now, if I got injured on the job and I wanted to claim workers' compensation, I had to make a claim to the provincial workers' compensation system. And then after I got approved, the provincial workers' compensation system would send a bill to the federal government, which would be paid under the authority of GECA. Now, what McKay, who's a lawyer, who's now with McKinnis Cooper, what they said was that, well, Government Employee Compensation Act Section 3.1. Now, I'm guessing that number. I can't remember exactly what it is. It says that regular force Canadian Forces members and RCMP members are not eligible for GECA. Now, I know it doesn't include, by strict legal definition, reserve force soldiers. But the intent, the spirit and intent of GECA is clearly to compensate injured civilians. Now, injured military members have a separate act. In the old days, it was called the Pension Act. So you don't compensate people under two different systems. So you didn't compensate injured military people, injured veterans, under GECA, because they had their own form of compensation called the Pension Act. Now, under the new Veterans Charter, and the government seems to want to be saving money all the time. Minister, former Minister of National Defense, Peter McKay, and them decided that it would be all right for people to get civilian compensation, even if you are a serving soldier. Now, I'm not going to go into explicit, excruciating detail, but I'll give you a few of the high, high uh, points about why this is absurd. Under provincial workers' compensation, there's a thing called the merit of principles. Now, under the merit of principles, one of the main principles is that you have to have a single point of compensation. So you're not supposed to be able to pick and choose which compensation system you would prefer. You might like to think it'd be nice for me to choose this one over that one, but that's not how it's supposed to work. And these are principles. They're not optional. Now, that's a main, the main one. But the other one is that it gives different amounts of compensation to people in different provinces. The Pension Act and the new Veterans Charter, the Veterans Wellbeing Act, they don't differentiate between injured veterans according to their province. So I know people might like workers' compensation better than Veterans Affairs, but that's not how it's supposed to be done, period. Now, with that out of the way, let me get into the bullshit of it dealing with the last little bit that got me all upset. Well, as usual, it has to do with the pensions and stuff, okay? So I've been reviewing different pension uh, audits by the Auditor General of Canada, the OAG. Now, one was in the 1986 audit, and it was concerning the Pension Act pension that was being held in trust for certain veterans who could not look after their own affairs. Now, as such, the pensions were being administered for the benefit of the veteran, and Veterans Affairs was a, tr a fiduciary. Now, when you are looking after uh, matters, could be anything, really. It could be money, or it could be doing something else that the person relied on you to live, like a child and a parent, because you had to provide the necessities of life to that child. You are a fiduciary. You have to take that person's interest into account before your own. Now, in that, there was a bunch of different things about the duties that the government wasn't following. And a lot of that spills over into the next report that I was looking at that bugged me so much, and it was the 1991 Auditor General Report on Debt Management and Employee Pensions. And then I'll read some of it off on the skim that so far. 
Chapter 8 of the 1991 report. For the past two decades, the federal government's annual expenditures have exceeded its revenues. Now, the Auditor General doesn't like that because that's a deficit. They want the government to have more revenue than expenses. This revenue for shortfall has been bridged, I hate that word, by borrowing, which has led to an increase in the public debt. Exhibit 8.1 summarized the growth in federal government liabilities by sector of category of debt over the last decade with projections to 1995-1996 based on the February 1991 budget. Section 8.8. .8, the government borrows from two sources. A. External. The government borrows externally from the general public by issuing certificates of indebtedness to lenders. Now, I think that's like bonds and stuff. Anyway, but B is the part that bugs me. Internal. A substantial portion of the government's budgetary deficit is financed through internal non-cash borrowing from specified purpose accounts. Now, right there, that's illegal. A special purpose account is set up when you have a trust arrangement, like the one at... Veterans Affairs, and like the federal pensions. So you have money that belongs to somebody else. So you can't put it into your general funds. It has to be put into a segregated bank account called a special purpose account. Now, the government has been borrowing from specified purpose accounts. So therefore, they have been using it for something other than what the contribution was collected for. You can't do that. Now, I'm sure the government would like to say that after we get elected, we are kings and we can do whatever we want. But you have to obey the rule of law. The rule of law says that when you're a fiduciary, you can't fucking do things for your own benefit, you son of a bitches. Now, these accounts are administered by the government for third parties. Now, the third party is us. As defined in the public accounts, special purpose accounts represent the recorded value of the financial obligations of the government of Canada in its role as administrator of certain public monies received or collected for specified purposes. See, I disagree with them. They talk about public monies, and it's not public monies that are collected. It's private money. As the administrator, okay, under personal to legislation, trust, treaties, undertakings, or contracts, okay, so in the tax budget of 26 February 1991, the government described superannuation, pension, and other special purpose accounts as trust accounts. So, anybody in the government that says the government is not a fiduciary, you cannot have a trust account for the superannuation retirement pensions without being a fucking fiduciary, you dumb fuckers. Okay? You just can't. Now, so they admit it. Any time that we have to go to court about this, we will be able to refer to the budget document of the 26th of February, 1991. And the government admitted that it owed a fiduciary duty to us. But it failed in that fiduciary duty because it fucking stole our surplus in the early 2000s or the late 1990s under Jean Chrétien. Now, they said the bulk of borrowings from SPAs comes from pension accounts. These borrowings do not involve cash, but rather result from a deferral payment of contributions. Oh, oh, these fuckers. And interest owed by the government. So, so, so. Now, see, I'm only reading it for the first time. I skimmed it before. But basically, the contributions that they're supposed to make to match our actual cash that they took off our check that we er earned with actual service, they deferred it. Oh, they have no shame. I wish I didn't know this stuff. That's why I've been bummed out the last few days, because it makes me wonder, like, what kind of government do we have? Like, we're supposed to have what's called a representative democracy, and we vote for our representatives, and they are supposed to make laws that are remedial. Laws that are remedial are meant to remedy problems. Now, for some reason, these people think that they can do whatever they want when they get elected. Now, to be honest, it's not the legislators that are doing this, it's the executive. But the legislators ought to be looking after the people that work for the government, the public service, the executive. 
Okay. So, it's so goddamn hard to understand how they think they can get away with it. Now, here's the problem, you see. In a democracy, you're supposed to have a thing called the rule of law. So the government <coughs> regulates many pensions. And, for example, it might say that pensions have to be funded because we don't want the employer going bankrupt. And when they go bankrupt, they then are relieved of all of their financial obligations. And the people that paid into a pension, that is thereby gone. And because it's gone, these people are left in peril. And because they're in peril, they're going to turn to the government for a bailout. And therefore, it's going to cost the taxpayers. So the government created laws to make sure that pensions are funded. But they didn't fund the federal pensions. So they said, you know, this is... Uh, I'm trying to think of the phrase now, but it's... But it's, you know, basically it's lip service. What's good for the goose should be good for the gander, or something like that. Look, you have to follow the same set of rules. Now, as I explained to a uh, member of parliament, the ministers, uh, uh, a minister in Newfoundland, Newfoundland has two ministers. So I spoke to, for 37 minutes, I believe, the minister over on the West Coast, Goody Hutchings' office. The lady was pretty good, she listened. But, as usual... Nobody seems to want to commit to when I'd say to them, listen, everything I said seems to make sense, right? So don't you agree that this is wrong? Oh, no, I can't offer an opinion. There might be something else. I said, listen, if everything I've said, and I hope I came across as credible, I'm quoting sections of Acts, I'm quoting cases, I'm quoting the Hansard. If everything I said is true, there's no reason to disagree with me, can't you? admit that this is un, un, improper, they shouldn't be doing it. Oh no, I can't make a comment. See, that's the kind of stupidity I'm talking about. Like, I'm not trying to hold them to something and catch, oh, I got you, you admitted it. I'm trying to say, as one person talking to another person, aren't I making sense? Like, am I not being reasonable? For me as a voter, for me as a person in a democracy that's supposed to follow the rules, I expect my government to be A, honest, and B, part of being honest is following the fucking rules. That's not too much to ask for. But as I explained to Sam in 1991, uh, 2000, nine years later, see, the government doesn't move very fast. The Arthurson case that was in the 1986 audit, that was fixed after... It was never fixed. But it was finally addressed in the courts in 2002, which was 16 years later. Now, the Auditor General's 1991 report about the federal pensions and this borrowing from the accounts, that was fixed, and I'll put air quotes up there for that, in 2000 when the government set up special purpose accounts that they should have had many years before. Now, because it wasn't set up from the beginning, there would have had been a point that they fixed it, but it should have been much sooner than 2000. I came under this, which is what I put into a post today. I started work for Indian Northern Affairs Canada, INAC, in 1991. So the government was borrowing against my consent. I did not give them consent to borrow my pension contributions, but they did it anyway, according to this audit, and I have no doubt that this continued even after the audit, because the government doesn't think it was anything wrong with it. But these kind of things like borrowing loans are supposed to be consensual. If you want to borrow money, it could be to buy a car, a boat, a house, could be for a trip, it could be whatever the fuck you want to do. You walk into a bank or some other lending institution, you negotiate, you offer, you tell them what you got and what you want it for, and then they will get you to sign a loan contract or a mortgage or something. Nothing happened here that anybody asked for our permission. That's scandalous. At least I think so. But it doesn't surprise me because it's like all that stuff I'm telling you about the Canada pension plan and getting ripped off. And it just seems that they don't think the rules apply to them. Now, carrying on, uh, 
They said the government was the present pension employee pension arrangement. Let me see. It's a legislative arrangement, section 8.11. All employee pensions are governed by legislation. The pension arrangements are legislated, not negotiated. Exhibit 8.2 briefly describes the current pension arrangement. Changes to the arrangement are affected through changes of existing pension legislation. For example, they say, in 1986, the government introduced a bill to substantially reform the pension arrangements. This bill died on the order table. Now, we understand that the government is working on a new legislative proposal. The government can make changes to these pensions through further legislation. Again, no negotiation. Now, if you were with a private employer, you would have contracts. And oftentimes, pensions are guided by agreement, contracts. But the government doesn't do that. It's somewhat insane when you think about it. For example, in 1970, the government enacted the Supplement Retirement Benefits Act. Also in 1983, when the wage and price controls were legislated, the indexing factor of the public service was cut back to 6.5 and 5.5% 5 .5 in 1983 and 1984, even though the increase for the consumer price index averaged 7.7%. Now let me tell you about the rule of law and them pricks that did this. You don't put into place consum con consumer price index inflation protection to protect people against the ravages of inflation and then because you might want to get more votes and save money you ignore the fact that inflation was 7.7 percent and you legislated it was 6.5 and 5.5 fucking percent these people are animals in people's clothing they, they aren't human if they think there's nothing wrong with that. You have to, if you want to trust someone, and you make what's called in pension terminology, the pension promise. Now, the employee must trust the person who makes that pension promise, and the pension promise is basically, I'll serve you as an employee. You'll pay me something now and something later. Now, for many years, the government didn't pay the consumer price index that I was just talking about because it was kept at 2% by law up until 1973. So, when inflation was higher than 2%, the federal government was quite okay for retired public servants, Canadian Forces members, and RCMP members to fall slowly into poverty. So when they brought the Supplement Retirement Benefit Act in, in 1970, and it never took effect till 1973, it was a good fucking law. I'm always criticizing the government. I could criticize them that they should have brought it in quicker. But it was a good law. You're not supposed to do what they did in the 1980s that I just read about, though. Because you had a good law in there, and then you fucked it up. Now, I was trying to cut back on the cursing, but by the Jesus, it's hard to do with these son of a bitches doing all this shit. If I had no cause to complain about reading this stuff, I would not be cursing. If the government had brought in the Supplement Retirement Benefit back in 1954, for example, I would be saying what a progressive government Canada has. The Public Service Superannuation Act originally was called the Civil Service Superannuation Act, dates back to 1954, and the government looked after its aged former workers by putting in their full consumer price indexing. But I can't say that because it would be a fucking lie. They didn't bring it in until 1970, and even then they never brought it into effect until 1973. So they built in a little buffer zone to give themselves a little extra cash on the side. Son of a fucking bitches. You know, I don't know how they get away with this stuff. I can't be the only person that ever discovered this. Now, that's one of the things I wanted to say tonight in my broadcast. The Auditor General doesn't make public reports, even though they're published and we can read them. They're made to Parliament. Now, you have the Auditor General making a report directly to Parliament. So they should be fixing the things that the Auditor General notes. Now, I'm not saying the Auditor General is always right, because I've discovered 
very serious mistakes in the past. There was one in 1966 or 69 that they were criticizing the way Veterans Affairs didn't give them information to the pension act. And, and I was thinking, the Dodger General don't know that where his fucking boundaries are. The compensation paid under the Pension Act is none of the fucking Auditor General's business because it's not a payment out of taxpayers' money. It is a payment that's being made to compensate a veteran in exchange for their right to sue that they gave up, the same as an injured worker in the civilian side gives up for workers' compensation. Therefore, there's not much interest in the taxpayers and saving money like the Auditor General is always trying to do. He's always trying to say, save money for the way the government operates. Now, i got no problem with that because I want the government to operate efficiently. But they also should get, like, know the facts. Like here, they seem to know the facts because they're talking about special purpose accounts. They're talking about the fact that the government shouldn't be doing it. That's a great start. Now, I was telling you about the pension promise. Let me tell you what the Auditor General says about it. Paragraph 8.12. The financial foundation of the pension plans is the government's promise to pay pension benefits to qualified employees on retirement and to their beneficiaries after their death. That's the pension promise. However, the federal government, the federal employee pension plans are not funded through investment in marketable securities. Instead, the plan's assets are borrowed by the government. So basically they have an, a cash cow, a source of revenue that's not available to anybody else. And that's what the stock market does. The stock market puts money out there and it's available to anybody if you want to pay the right price. Now the government had a captive market. They had the money that they should have been paying to the person when they earned it. But it, by law, it, some of that money was diverted for the future. Now, let me tell you something that you probably never thought about. I've said it before, so you might have heard. In the Gill 1973 Supreme Court of Canada case, they made this very apt point about a person could never get their pension. A person could be single and die before they retire and have no beneficiary named. So you could contribute to a defined benefit pension that you ought to be able to enjoy in your retirement. But, but, because of fate, because of circumstances, you might never get to receive and enjoy your pension. Now, in that case, I've never looked it up, but I assume common sense says that the money stays in the plan because who else would fucking get it? Now, on that point, let me digress a bit because it seems that the government wants people to believe that if you die and you have a public service Canadian Forces and RCMP superannuation act pension, then it's automatic. Everybody does this. That the surviving spouse gets 50% of what the pensioner gets. But that's not true. There are many forms of pensions. It depends on what the plan is set up for. You could have any kind of arrangement. For a few dollars more, I was reading about certain plans that if you died, your spouse will get 100% of the pension. And it would only cost so much per payment to, to fund that. Now, I bet a lot of people would like to have the security for their family where after they kicked the bucket, they'd know that what they're getting now while they're alive would continue to be paid to their surviving spouse. But the government has us hoodwinked into believing that it has to be 50%. No. Another point about that, and I'm trying not to lose my train of thought, because I, I kind of did here. Um, where was I going with that? Anyway, the, the point is, is that they, there's more than one way to skin a cat about pensions. Like, I wish they had done things right. I, I know they don't want it to be complicated, right? So they don't want us to have the option to get 100%. Because here's the problem, at least as I see it. In the old days, employers view pensions as gratuitous, freely given. So now, if you're giving someone a pension out of the goodness of your heart, whatever you decide to give them is better than nothing. 
right now that has changed because it's bullshit first of all when I worked for Indian Northern Affairs as a teacher in Wibquay, Ontario from 1991 to 1994 and after that I went to Customs in Gander, Newfoundland from 94 to 96 I served my employer the public as part of my service I received pay now because of superannuation acts part of my pay was diverted for the future now I didn't have a choice about that because they passed a law to make me contribute to it but that money is supposed to be there for me and not them to borrow against now that's one point now as I was explaining to the minister of something I could look it up if I really cared but Goody Hutching is the minister I think for it used to be called ECOA or something like the Eastern something development money they're trying to pump money into the Maritimes anyway they could have paid me my entire salary and I could have made my own retirement arrangements but they didn't now stay, stay clear so so the thing is is that they are holding my money in the bank on paper according to the editor general but now believe it or not I don't really have a whole lot of problem with this subject to a few caveats if they decided to only have a paper debt and not have actual bank accounts and they paid market value interest I wouldn't care but where they gave less than market value, I do care because they're taking advantage of them holding on to the money. They're breaching their fiduciary duty. Well, when I was looking all this stuff up in the 1986 audit that they did on the uh, pension act pensioners, they called this technical self-dealing. So I googled that. Now self-dealing is when a fiduciary looks after their own interest ahead of their beneficiary. That's exactly what happened here. When the government borrowed, and not at market rates, it was self-dealing. It was giving itself an advantage. It didn't ask us, and it just did it. Now, I'm pretty willing to bet that it was the executive branch that was doing all this, not, not the legislators, but again, they should be keeping track of it. And I half believe that it's the executive people working for Finance Canada that probably sold the government, the legislators, this crack of shit. That it's our money. See, my theory is, and I think I've read this many times, the government puts more money in as a contribution usually than the employee. Oh, that's what I forgot earlier. When I was talking to the member of Parliament who's the minister over in the West Coast, I said to her, you know, according to the common law, you know, we have a case called IBM versus Waterman, 2013, Supreme Court of Canada. And in that case, the contributions that were made by IBM on behalf of Mr. Waterman, even though he didn't pay it physically, the company paid it for him, that was his property because they said service has value, time has value. So I said, what is should be happening is there should be zero contribution deducted from a person's pay and the person's service should be enough now that's something I told the Public Service Alliance Canada two days ago because I called them or yesterday actually today I called the member of Parliament yesterday I called the Public Service Alliance Canada media person now what I was doing there not to get too sidetracked I'll probably go back to that document in front of me eventually I used to be part of PSEC, which is a large organization, and they have legal people. In fact, they were part of a, opposing the government about the government stealing our actuary surplus in the late 90s or the early 2000s. The government decided it owned the surplus, and it took it to the courts, and the union disagreed, and I don't know how stupid their lawyers were, but they lost. They shouldn't have lost. Pensions are property. The person's salary is their property. If you take part of that property and put it away for the future, that's their property. Therefore, the government is a fiduciary. 
Now, if the government is a fiduciary looking after our property, and there happens to be too much money in that pension plan, we put the money in, it's our property, so it's our fucking surplus. It's as simple as that. However, somehow, the government convinced the Supreme Court of Canada, sometimes I think the Supreme Court of Canada is in on it with the government. But I will give a small caveat. Legally, the trustee or the employer is the owner of a pension plan. But the caveat only goes so far because, equitably, it belongs to the pensioner, the contributor. Now, the reason for that is that, well, you can't have something that's a property if it has no legal owner. But they have to administer it on behalf of us. They're not supposed to do what's good for them and not and leave us short that's the self-dealing i'm talking about so the government did it legally by the book they went to court and they won but they must have had the court in their back pocket or the union's lawyers were incompetent one or the other maybe something in between but uh, it's so galling to see this stuff happen okay like it shouldn't happen if you're going to look after my property then you better do a good job you know, I got no choice about you taking off my check. But when you get that money and it's mine, you can't say it's yours. You can argue, and again, this is where I was going before. You can put money in with it, okay? For the Canadian Forces Superannuation Act, I was looking at the actuarial results from my uh, reviews and stuff. And I didn't put Google up. Let me drag, it up, drag up my observation post account and I'll look at the picture. So back in 2007, they put out a report, Treasury Board Secretary did, called Total Compensation. And the report went into all of the different elements of the compensation of a RCMP member, a Canadian Forces member, or a public servant. Because it's not all salary. So part of that is like employment insurance contributions that they match or put more in. Part of it is the Canada Pension Plan and stuff. Part of it is the Canadian Forces, RCMP, and Public Service Pensions that they might put more in on. Now, they said that for the Canadian Forces, I hope I'll find that. I see the picture right here. Okay, this was Table 2090 in that report. And it says, details of employer and member contributions to the Canadian Forces Super uh, Pension Plan for current service 1990 to 1991 to 2002, 2003. And I drew a line across the year 2000, because that was when they started to do it right <clears throat> and put it into specified purpose accounts. But say the first year that I started with the public service. Now, this is the Canadian Forces, not the public service one, but I'll give you those figures. In 1991, there was $392 million that was paid as the employer share into the Canadian Forces Superannuation Act, and it should have been put into the special purpose account. But instead, it was only listed as a paper liability from the Consolidated Revenue Fund. The member's share was $184 million. The total contribution was $576 million when they add the two. Now, see, here's the problem I have with this faulty accounting. IBM versus Waterman 2013 says that all of that contribution was made by the Canadian Forces member. All of it. The employer may have paid the money physically, but it was paid on behalf of the Canadian Forces members in relation to their service. In other words, it's pay. So you can't claim that it's the government's money that's put in there because in pension law there's a thing called confusion and it is confusing. But the point is you have to be able to trace a contribution from where it came from and where it went. You have to follow the money. So by the government trying to say that it owns the pension they're going against pension law once again because they're making it confusing. It's supposed to be a clear path. You should be able to follow a person's contribution. So, uh, on the bottom here is what I was getting. Employer contributions in respect to Canadian Forces Pension were quite stable most through most of the 1990s. 
remaining generally in the range of $400 million. Only two years, 1993 to 1994, and 1994 to 1995, were materially higher at about $425 million. Now, materialness is 4%. So, it's within 4%. It's, it's below 4%, it's immaterial. And if it's above 4%, it's material. Now, reviewing these figures in light of contemporaneous changes to the population of the Canadian Forces members modifies the perspective somewhat. The downward trend in employee contribution between 1991 and 1998 parallels a reduction in members. Uh, okay, the third paragraph is the one I was really looking for the other bit. I'm just talking. The ratio, this is what I wanted, to, of employer to member Canadian Forces superannuation and contribution has grown federally steadily through the period from 1992 to 2003, increasing from about 2.13 to 1 in the former year to 3.54 to 1 in the latter. The portion of current service costs borne by the employer went up over the same period from 68 to 78 percent. Now, see, this is where they do what I call misrepresentation. They claim that the employer bore the cost of the pension. Well, no, they didn't. You know who bore the cost of the pension? The person that earned the money. So that was the Canadian Forces member. So even though the government had to pay a contribution on behalf of the Canadian Forces member, they were merely paying the employer's share of what they owed to the pension plan. That's what IBM versus Waterman, 2013, Supreme Court of Canada said. Now, they're trying to say that they're kind of inventing the alternate reality where their contribution matters in a fucking defined benefit pension. Now, let me explain the difference between a defined benefit and a defined contribution pension plan. In a defined benefit pension plan, the contributions don't mean squat. You get a pension based on a formula. The formula in our pension is 2% accrual rate times the number of years of service to a maximum of 35 years, so you can only get a 70% pension. And then they take that 70% and they multiply it by the best five years average salary. It used to be six years, but they changed it to five. God bless their fucking souls. Actually, that's a good point, so I shouldn't complain too much about it. Now, when you take that formula, and I'll use $100,000 a year to make it simple. Someone who had 35 years, 2% of that time, 35 years accrual rate, 2% uh, accrual rate times 35 years, 70% will get, and you had five years at $100,000, so 70% of $100,000, you will get a pension of $70,000 a year. That's a defined benefit pension the way it works. Now, a defined contribution pension, your contribution actually matters. Whatever you put in will affect how much you get out. So you could contribute money to a defined contribution pension plan, and it could get invested, the investment sucked, and you might actually lose money. That's the downside. Now, you could put it into an investment, do really well, and do better than a defined benefit pension. That's the upside. But you know something? A lot of people like security. They like, they love defined benefit pensions. They hate insecurity. They hate defined contribution fucking pensions. It's that fucking simple, I believe. I should cut back on the fuckings, I guess. But Canada Post, for example, in the stuff I've been posting, a few years ago, they were trying to get, they had a strike, and one of the things that they were trying to get rid of was the defined benefit pension plan. And they were trying to move to a defined contribution plan because it's better for them. Now, one of the things that they put out that I put, took a screenshot of because it proves my point, the Canada Post Board of Directors has the fiduciary duty to oversee the activities of both roles to ensure they are conducted responsibly in the best interest of all plan members. So you see, this is an admission by the government for, admittedly, a separate agency, because the government 
struck off Canada Post, made it separate. But they're still the government, okay? It's like Canada Customs and Revenue Agency, which I got transferred to, became Canada Revenue Agency after Customs and Border Services got created. They were still the government. They collect tax revenue for fuck's sakes. So, so all of the federal pensions, like all pensions, owe a fiduciary duty to the members. And it was admitted in this Canada Post document when the strike was on, and I took a picture of it. Now, I'm going through this to see what else I was going to see. The, okay, so we have a fiduciary duty owed to the contributor. The government doesn't admit, refuses to admit, fights very hard to deny that there is a fiduciary duty owed to the pensioner, the contributor. Now, I got some insight into that today when I was looking up stuff. And I saw that on the 12th of February, 1979, Jean-Robert Gauthier, a member of Parliament, a liberal, was in the House of Commons and they were talking about stuff that was just crap. But it came up, the reason for this stuff, why they do it. And essentially, they're trying to get votes from the public. They're trying to buy votes. And the public thinks that public servants, Canadian Forces, and the RCPM members get a gold-plated pension. So that means if they do something to restrict our pension, it makes them look good to the voter and they get more votes. So what the members said back there is, oh, I see that we have an election coming up. And he called out the government on it. I'm presuming that it was a conservative government because the liberal called them out. So, so basically, in order to appease the people who vote for them, they have been fucking over all of us on our pensions. And one of the things I wrote down here when I was trying to think of what to do here, what to talk about tonight... I was thinking about, you know, it's funny. In 1964, on the 18th of November, Minister of Health and Welfare, Judy LaMarche, they knew how pensions worked because she was asked a question by the opposition, Mr. Chatterton, and he said, listen, if a public servant becomes disabled, are they going to get the Canada Pension Fund Disability and the Public Service Superannuation Act Disability Payments? She said, yes, of course. He will get them all. If he had five or six pensions, he would get all of them. So the government of the time in 1964 knew that pensions were property, knew that pensions had a fiduciary responsibility, and that you couldn't reduce one pension by another one. Now fast forward to 1979, what I was reading today, and got my blood boil the government seemed to have lost the corporate knowledge that pensions are property that pensions are have the trustee owing a fiduciary duty to the contributor what's wrong with these people don't they have good advisors because I know that members of parliament come from all walks of life they could be a fisherman or a farmer or a lawyer or whatever they run for office and these clowns... Oops, did I say that? They run a popularity contest. And then when they form a government, they could be put into a portfolio that they have no clue about. Like pensions or possibly veterans affairs. And then they have to rely on the expert advice of Finance Canada or the Deputy Ministers of Veterans Affairs or whatever. And they seem to take all this stuff as gospel. What they're told. Well, they should do their own due diligence and they should understand that pensions are property because in 1990 there was a case that went to the Supreme Court of Canada and it happened to be about the Canadian Forces Superannuation Act. Clark versus Clark, 1990, had a divorce. A lot of the cases about pensions revolve around divorce. Now, at the Nova Scotia Court of Appeal, the verdict was is that the Canadian Forces Superannuation Act was income. This didn't sit well with 
one of the two litigants. And they took it to the highest court in Canada, Supreme Court of Canada, who reversed the previous court's decision and said, you made a mistake. Pensions are really property. Now, who do you think is right? The highest court in Canada or the court below it? Now, the thing is, is that is a precedent. And precedents create order in society. So when you have people that go against a precedent, and this is about the Canadian Forces Superannuation Act, don't forget. So we know that the Canadian Forces Superannuation Act is property because it's been to court. So if it's property, then comes the question of whose property is it? Well, obviously, I mean, if it's going to get split 50-50 in a divorce case as property, it's the property of the pensioner, not the government. See, unless we live in a communist society where the government owns everything we own, which is not supposed to be the case. Canada is socialist, but we're not communist. So... The upshot of all this stuff is that one of these days, like I said to the uh, union person, I said, one of the things that I can help you with, your members with, and I'm hoping you guys will give me, and I'll look into it and support my ideas, and you got more power and money than me, is, uh, well, the contributions, for example. You only get half of that right now in taxes. Now, I just lost my train of thought, but I threw it in there. Hopefully, it was seamless and you didn't notice. But I told you about it. So, I said, you know, under the Canada Pension Plan example, the employer pays 100% of what the employee had deducted from their check. But on taxes at the end of the year, you only get to claim half of that amount. So, that would affect, that would assist your members if they had a higher tax deduction. So, I'm not coming to you asking for help. I'm coming to you offering help. So, I said the bridging amount. That was the main, that was the thing I lost, I forgot about a second or two ago. I said the government is basically subsidizing the taxpayer and its contribution towards the public service, RCMP, and the Canadian Force of Superannuation Act pensions. And we conveniently have a way to estimate that. Because after Peter Stoffer introduced Bill C-201 in 2010 or 11 or something, the public, the Parliamentary Budget Office did a report. How much would it cost if they fixed it, if they ended bridging? Don't forget, the members of Parliament actually voted to end bridging. In a democracy, that should have been respected. That the will of the people, as spoken by our representatives, voted on in the House of Commons and said, get rid of bridging. Now, they said that it was 19%. So if they got rid of bridging, then the taxpayers would have to pay 19% more into the Federal Superannuation Act pensions, not the public service one, but the RCMP and the Canadian Forces one, because Peter Stoffer's bill didn't affect the Public Service Superannuation Act. He didn't put that on his bill. He only wanted to help uh, RCMP and the Canadian Forces members, and usually if they were disabled. I agree with that sentiment, but in a fair world, we have to fix it for the public servants as well. So to add a little more uh, carrot in front of the horse, I said it would even help healthy former PSEC members, because at age 65, the bridging would end. Right now, many people lose a part of their pension, even if they're healthy and retire at age 65. They have the bridging kick in, and therefore, they have less money. Well, what I'm saying is that pensions have to be stacked, and I'm not saying it just because of my opinion. I'm saying it because that was the design of the program. Back in 1964, Minister LaMarche, and the fact that you're supposed to get a stacked pension instead of what they call an integrated pension. Now, it's going to cost a lot of money for them to fix this. Because a lot of people do this. Provincial governments across the country do it. And the federal government does it. And it's unconstitutional in the case of the federal government. I said to Minister Hutchings, uh, Stafford. 
I said, you know, do you know anything about the Constitution Act? Oh, a little bit. Well, I said, when they set up the Constitution Act, they set up the responsibilities of the federal and the provincial governments. They separated the powers of the branches, of the levels of government. And under Section 9213, they decided that property and civil rights would be exclusively the jurisdiction of the provinces. Now, Canadian Forces Superannuation Act Section 15-2B and Public Service Superannuation Act Section 11-2 and the RCMP Superannuation Act Section 15-2B are federal legislation and are therefore unconstitutional because these are laws that affect property and civil rights which reside exclusively with the provinces. Now, why did the federal government make unconstitutional law, is the question. And it's not like it hasn't happened before. I can point out to two examples. The Unemployment Insurance Act, when it was first introduced, was decided by the Supreme Court of Canada to be unconstitutional. Canada responded by changing the Constitution. So if you can't do something the right way, you fix it by going on, doing an end run around it and change the law itself. That's not a good lesson, as far as I'm concerned. Now, there are pros and cons to it, and maybe that's an okay decision. I think the other one is old age security. And because pensions are provincial, the first law that the federal government brought in, I think it was in 1927, but I don't call it that. Again, it was ruled to be unconstitutional because it was a property and civil right. It belonged to the provinces. So, again, they changed the Constitution, which at the time was the British North America Act. So they couldn't do it themselves. They had to petition the British government to change our Constitution. Now, all of these things make me very cynical. I was going to say somewhat cynical. Right? I mean... I'll give you another example. I think I'll shut up now because I think I've talked enough. The thing that I call double dip clawbacks and triple dip clawbacks, I went to Minister of Veterans Affairs at the time, Seamus O'Regan's office. Didn't speak to him personally, but I spoke to his staffer. I have with me the person who had the example, uh, leading seaman retired, I think, or master seaman retired, Sean Corrine. And we explained how it wasn't fair, it wasn't equitable for the federal government to take things into account more than once. So he gets the Canada Pension Plan, it gets deducted from the Service Income Support Insurance Plan. He gets Canada Pension Plan, it's deducted from the Canadian Forces Superannuation Act. He gets the Canada Pension Plan Disability, it's deducted from Veterans Affairs Income Replacement Benefits. So he gets the Canadian Forces Superannuation Act pension, it's deducted at the Service Income Support Insurance Plan, and it's deducted at the Income Replacement Benefit. As the kicker, he was getting the Pension Act pension, and he was part of the Dennis Minouge class action, and they resolved that, allegedly. But at the time, in 2006, they were taking the Pension Act from his income replacement benefits. So they were double dipping on the pension. You can't claim something and take it into account and reduce a payment at two different places. If you took half off at each place, you might have a case. But you can't take 100% off at each place. And in the case of the Canada the Pension Plan Disability, if they took 33% each off, and so that you didn't end up in the hole, they might have a case. But what the government is doing is unconscionable. It's shameful. They're not following what the regular insurance industry does. If the insurance industry has two different companies wanting to take into account the Canada Pension Plan Disability, they don't both take 100% and piss off the person, and then the person goes talk to their member of parliament or hires a lawyer, and then it gets their, their upsets the apricot cart. Oh no, they each take 50%. But the federal government doesn't realize that that's an option, I guess. I'm putting that in there sarcastically. Because I can sympathize with the worker, the public servant, 
who has to do this because they're merely doing their job. But you ought to have a brain. You ought to be able to use it and you ought to be able to think this is going to harm the person that was disabled in our service. So instead of looking at the legalities, how about you look at the person as an individual? Had they not joined the Canadian military, had they not either gotten disabled in a war or training for war, then they wouldn't be getting the kind of the pension plan disability. They'd be continuing serving and having their contributions put away for their retirement. But they became disabled, and then they get taken advantage of, not once, not twice, but three fucking times. I'm telling you, if people don't go to jail for this, I'll be surprised. It might be years in the May in the before they get locked up. But you shouldn't harm our national defense public policy by doing this. And as long as people don't know, it's not harming it. But things come out usually. Right? Like I'm doing my best to make it public. And you know, there's laws about this. There's laws about Canada. If you wear the uniform or you wear medals and you're not entitled to them, you can go to jail. Well, how about if you take someone who was in uniform legitimately, who might have medals legitimately, and then you abuse them financially and psychologically, and you harm the national interest? I think that's worse than wearing a medal you're not entitled to, or the uniform you shouldn't wear because you didn't sign up for. Isn't that a greater crime against Canadian society than the two things that I just mentioned? Hopefully people won't come back and say, oh, no, that's that's not nearly as bad. But uh, anyway, listen, talk long enough. I hope I didn't go too astray and I did, was mostly cogent and going in a train of thought because I think I was. I mean, but this is my perspective. And I don't have a script to follow and do point one, two, three, four. I'm just winging it. But I usually try to go from point A to point B and then C or whatever and I'm hoping I mean I keep someone post it to my after I made a post the other day can you explain this in layman's terms listen funny thing is I thought I already had put it in as simple terms as possible and I didn't say that to him but I tried to rephrase it but I've been trying my best to put all of this in simple terms. Like I could have said it's illegal about the double and triple dip clawbacks, but I used the term unfair. Because that might not scare off people from investigating. Because if I say it's illegal, people could go to jail. They might circle the wagons and then never look into it. But I can't help it. I got obsessive compulsive personality disorder. It might be a far-fetched idea it might never happen but i can guarantee you that there is more than zero percent and there might be more than 50 percent which is to say that a crime is possible and maybe probable and the reason that that sticks in my head is i've also read cases about criminal law and the police if they're asked to investigate something they have to think that a crime is possible based on the constellation of evidence that they have available they don't have to tell the subject that they're <coughs> subject to an investigation they can start one and then stop it later they have a lot of discretion about charging people but you know I mean you don't have to think that a crime is probable to start an investigation to justify a criminal investigation, the police have to have a possible crime, which means more than 0% and less than 50. So everything I've been saying about fraud, I mean, it could be fraud against the government, it could be fraud against me, it could be fraud against whoever. This thing about that uh, borrowing money without authorization, I mean, if you were doing that in the private sector, imposing loans on someone and then doing at preferred rates, that sounds like something the mafia would do. You know, loan sharking or something like that. And the government doesn't think there's anything wrong with it. Now, at least they sort of fixed it. 
where they put it into the market in 2000. But I am curious about whether a special purpose account is ours or theirs. Do they think it's theirs because of the special purpose account? I guess it doesn't really matter in the long run, as long as they stop borrowing against it, first of all. But I wonder if they transferred all the assets over. Because what brings that up is those... Asana Alberta has this crazy idea that they want to set up their own pension plan like Quebec has instead of being in the Canada pension plan. So they want half of the Canada pension plan assets. Well, Alberta, here's a Newfoundlander telling you what you can do. Now, I'm not doing this because I don't like Alberta. I'm not flipping them to bird because of that. I'm saying that you voluntarily entered into the Canada Pension Plan in 1966, and you could have done what Quebec did in 1966, but you chose voluntarily to participate in the Canada fucking Pension Plan. So therefore, you can't say at a later date that we want to take half of the money that's in it after all of us contributed to it over a period of, what, 80 years? No, 60, 66 to now. Well, hey, that's the year I was born. It was 57 years ago. So, they want to take half of the assets out of the Canada Pension Plan, when as far as I'm concerned, what they would have to do, you can go ahead and do it. It's legally your right to start up a pension plan like Quebec did. But I think they'd have to start from scratch and have no contributions in the account until people started paying in from the province of Alberta based on the rules that Alberta sets up. And then they can start accumulating pension reserves, actuarial reserves. In fact, not bragging, but I know a lot about this. I think I'm a subject matter expert, or a SME. In 1966, they didn't have a lot of assets in the Canada Pension Plan. So they had to accumulate those assets over time. So the first few people that got pensions from the Canada Pension Plan, there was no money in there to pay them. They had to borrow basically, against future contributions. Anyway, listen, I better stick to my guns and say thanks for watching, for the party people that kept watching. I'm, you know, I mean, I'm not the most charismatic person in the world, but I think this message that I keep trying to dumb down and make it so that anybody can understand that we should try to get these things changed through political or legal means. In a perfect world, none of this stuff should have happened. They should have followed the rules everybody else has to follow. But they didn't. I mean, better late than never that they started at all, some people might say. Anyway, I'll see you next week.